Well, we moved here when I was five and um, discovered fairly soon after that Ella had lived here. We'd learned from various people st still in the village then and from reading around that this was someone of, of some significance. And so um, th th the interest began to grow from that, really. Herefordshire was a county undergoing quite a lot of change. There had been a big agricultural depression from about 1870 to 1900. This led to a lot of people moving away from the county and so the population kind of stayed quite stagnant. The nature of Herefordshire farming also changed from more arable crops to more cows and livestock. So you get to see more of the cattle that we associate with Herefordshire today. Well, I think Herefordshire was an area perhaps where some of the folklore traditions had survived longer than others because of the relative lack of um, influence of the Industrial Revolution and the fact that Herefordshire is a bit sort of out in the wild. Her father was a farmer. Um, they lived at Bidney Farm, which is about five miles from Webley, it's nearer Dilwyn. I think he was quite a successful hop farmer. She was one of seven children. I would imagine quite a, quite a good, loving family. We believe she went to Dilwyn School, but she then moved to Clyde House School in Widemar Street in Hereford, which was a school established for the children of farmers and other tradespeople where they would get a good general education, but also practical things like bookkeeping uh, uh, and so on. I imagine she played around the farm and she mentions a lady called Martha who came to visit. And um, Martha lived in a little cottage not too far away from the farm. And I think it seems that it was Martha who was telling her these little snippets of folklore and stories and so on and it's sort of conjectured that that was perhaps the, the seed, the beginning of her interest in folklore collecting. She went on to Hereford High School for Girls and did fairly well there. Ella's husband-to-be, Frank, was from a Yorkshire family. He moved to Hereford. His father was a solicitor, as was his grandfather. And strangely, Frank's father kind of abandoned his Hereford family and went off to the south coast and seemed to have had a, a separate family life there, more or less disowning his, his um, Hereford family. Frank's mother died and so Frank and his surviving sister were orphans and were looked after by a gentleman called John Bulmer. They were married in 1893, Ella was 19, John Bulmer was very generous to them. He gave them the house and also helped to establish Frank in his legal practice. So really it was a, an amazing start for them. Otherwise it could be that they, they wouldn't have thrived in the way that they did. Their first child was born the year after their marriage. So he became the focus, I guess, of their life together. I discovered that uh, my grandmother who, was, who had moved here with us, had worked for Ella Leather in her young days. She was nanny to their children. John, who was the oldest child born in 1894, the second child, Geoffrey, was born in 1896. But he died at quite a young age, having choked on a chicken bone. There was tragedy again there. Then they had a third son, Godfrey, who, who survived them and Godfrey actually in later years also became a solicitor. So the tradition of, of being in the legal profession seems to have run right through the story. I think Ella was always a really active sort of person. She was very much involved in community life. She was keen on helping people generally. It's noted that she was particularly keen on helping poor people and helping their education. But also, we discover she was a keen photographer, and I think it was 1899, she won a, a second prize in the competition of that year uh, with her photograph called Granny.
1906, I think it was, she was asked to write an article in a general book on Herefordshire, but her topic was to be folklore. And she produced quite a, a wealth of stories and information. By that date, she must have already built up quite a, a collection of material to draw upon. Her sources were in the locality, particularly gypsy families, but also ordinary folk, as it were, in and around the village and, and in the area. She used to go out in her pony and trap and visit them. I wonder if she didn't sort of get some idea that there was a heritage of folklore to be investigated and recorded on her visits to people who were sick and so on. You can imagine before health service, they were reliant on folk cures, folk remedies, some quite bizarre. So maybe she came across this and realized that was something worth noting. Ella Mary Leather was interested in the naming of monuments throughout the landscape. So there are lots of places that have distinctive names. Sometimes they're stones, sometimes they're mounds, sometimes they're trees. And what she was trying to pick up was how those names came to be given. What inspired them was the appearance of monuments. And you find time and time again, if there was a chamber or a cave or some hole in the ground, it would be linked to the idea that people um, were not only buried there, but potentially they had gone there and they will re-emerge. She was in touch with a lady who was doing similar work in Shropshire, Charlotte Byrne, and I think they kind of shared their findings. Then she got in touch or was introduced to people like Cecil Sharp and Lucy Broadwood and others who were more interested in the musical, the folk songs. One of the circle was uh, Ray Fawn Williams, who was really at the beginning of his sort of composing career. Ella Mary Leather was really keen to her material down and also to publish it so that there would be a permanent record of a lot of these stories. Folklore of Herefordshire book didn't appear till 1912 so she had quite a period of collecting before that. It seems that the earlier part of her uh, collecting was more related to the folklore and oral traditions, but then from about 1905 up to 1912, when the book was published, perhaps there was more in emphasis on the folk songs and dances. It's quite a small edition, so maybe not very widely distributed in terms of across the country. But I think to other folklore collectors and specialists in that area, it was really quite highly regarded. The systematic way that she'd done it was particularly appreciated. And the fact that she was able to compare some of the traditions, the cures, the sayings with similar sayings from other parts of the country suggested that she had a good knowledge of the background of folklore collecting and was able to pick out things which were more particular to Herefordshire and maybe not found elsewhere. Every village or parish has its own war memorial, which gives testament to the number of young men who were killed in the conflict. In Hereford itself, things got so bad that they had to appoint a woman doctor for the first time to Hereford General Hospital because they didn't have enough men to fill the position. So it exacerbated all the changes. World War One. 1914. All the family was affected by that. Frank had been in charge of the local company of Herefordshire Rifle Volunteers and he himself was part of the Shropshire Light Infantry, so quite a sort of military commitment there. In parallel with other people who had large houses around the country, a gentleman in Sarnesfield opened his house to become a Red Cross hospital and they received wounded people from the front line. Ella was a nurse at this Red Cross hospital and became appointed commandant in charge of the hospital where she stayed till I think 1917. She became unwell and, and left, but she was awarded a Red Cross medal for her services. Their son John had gone to Oxford 
and was doing really well. But with the outbreak of war, he joined up and went to France on a couple of occasions, different missions. And then towards, I think it was about 1916, 17, he returned to the front lines. And it appears that in the closing days of the war, there was this great outbreak of Spanish influenza, which John contracted, and he died in France in 1918, which was a, a tremendous blow to the family. And it, reading between the lines, I feel it was perhaps something they never really came to terms with, but there we are. And after the war, you had a generation of people who were perhaps disabled by their experience in the war, and so they weren't be able to take on the agricultural tasks that they did beforehand. And you also have a generation of women who lost their loves and the potential for marriage, um, and this affected society as a whole. It seems that there was so much loss all over the country that many people were sort of seeking to somehow get in touch with folks who, who died. There was this rise in spiritualism and I think Ella was involved with that. To what degree, I don't know. Although she was still involved with village life, folklore and folk song sort of took a back seat after the war and after this tragedy. Anyway, she did pick up her interest. She was a, a founder member of Webley WI and its first president. She was also still involved in local history. She was writing various leaflets and so on. And folk dance was something which she re retained an interest in. Ella continued her work in the community through the 20s and was well known for her generosity to folks. But in June 1928, she and Frank were invited to the 21st birthday party of one of the Cottrell family at Garnons. They went and returned, I, I gather, rather late. And then the following day, um, Ella died. She was at her desk in her study, and she was found slumped over her desk at the age of 51. There was a great sense of loss in the village. Reading through the Hereford Times accounts of the funeral, it was a very solemn affair, as you might expect, but a lot of people attended. The school children formed a guard of honour, did members of the WI. She was buried on the north side of the churchyard where there is the white marble Celtic cross. Her husband, Frank, commissioned a couple of portraits of Ella, one in the Red Cross uniform and another one of her in her study in the old grammar school, which is next door to here where she did her work. Frank Leather only lasted another 15 months or so. He died in November 1929. The, the whole thing came to a rather sort of sudden and rather tragic end in a way. Ella's legacy, obviously the record of what she did, is significant. It gives a window onto a world really that doesn't exist now. I mean, it was a pre-scientific world where something couldn't be explained. You resorted to natural phenomena or superstition and so on. I mean, it's largely disappeared, but without Ella's work, we would have very little of it available to us now. So I think that's, that's a really important legacy. When she was doing that collection, there were lots of stories. Now, there still are, but they're of a different kind and they're adjusted to the modern world. You still need to pick up people's stories and what that does is it captures things which are not necessarily written. There's no one who sort of remembers her particularly now, so it's through the book and through a number of other publications are the only way we can get in contact with her and the world that she sought to record. It's interesting that we found a note about Ella's work in a magazine in America. So, you know, it's uh, the legacies across the Atlantic. <laughs>